I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that all this development will not be in vain in any life in Jesus' name. Tonight, I pray that the Lord will speak to everyone. And what he says, we are going to accept. We are going to receive. To lift you up and make you what you ought to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you because you are raising us up. You are developing us so we can be the ministers, men and women we ought to be. We are praying, Lord, that your power will work more and more through every life in Jesus' name. Use your people for your glory, that this work of the Lord will prosper in every hand. Lift us up. Develop us, up. Develop us. Move us forward. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. We're coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 21 and verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. Providing for, the honest, for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. It's talking about our commitment. And it's talking about our calling. That as we are in the various ministries and various areas, everything we do will not just be in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of all men. And it tells us in verse 22. In verse 22 it says, And we, our saints with them, our brother, whom we have often provided, proved diligent in many things. Underline that word, diligent, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. All the things we're learning as we come to our Tuesday development uh, leadership, uh, leadership development, we can only make use of them and we can profit the congregation by being diligent and telling the Lord everything I learn. I want to make use of that. I want to perfect the people of God through the things that I learn. And tonight, as we're going through the series on leadership, I'm talking to you on the drive and the diligence of divinely approved leaders. The drive we have and the diligence we have as we look into the approved ministry the Lord has called us to. And I pray, as we have that drive, inner drive, and as you have that diligence, the Lord will make use of everything you've got so that by the grace of God, this work will prosper in your hand. It will prosper in my hand. I shall do great, mighty, wonderful things through your life and through my life and through your ministry and through my ministry in Jesus' name. Diligence. We're going to be diligent. You'll be diligent. I will be diligent. And the Lord will bless our diligence in Jesus' name. Hebrews, I'm reading from chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God as you minister to the people of God. You want to make sure that you are watching over yourself and you're thinking over your ministry so that you're looking diligently. You're behaving diligently. You are acting diligently. You're doing everything you are called to do diligently so that no man will fail, no man will fall from the grace of God. And then it says, lest any root of bitterness trouble you. Any, any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you. And then it says, so that many other people might be defiled. 
I pray that your ministry will not defile people. Your ministry will not destroy people. Your ministry will uphold people and make them to move forward in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. If that is going to be so, we need to be diligent in having, diligent in possessing, and diligent in retaining the grace of God in our lives. Look at verse 28. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, be diligent, that all the grace you need, you have. All the grace you need, you possess. All the grace you need, you manifest. You're receiving the grace from the Lord, and you're abiding in that grace of God, and then you're ministering in that grace that takes diligence, that no time will you go up from the grace of God that is given unto you. Then it said that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. We're looking at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. It's still calling us to diligence as it says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of men ought she to be in all holy conversation and uh, godliness. There will be godliness in our lives. Holiness in our lives. And that holiness and purity will help us. You know, when you have holiness and purity in the heart, there will be confidence. There will be no guilt. There will be no condemnation. And the devil will not be accusing you. Uh-huh. Is it to preach? Uh-huh. Is it to talk? Is it to tell other people, go this way? But where is the holiness and righteousness in your life? I pray the devil will not succeed in uh, accusing you of anything in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens been on fire. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt to a fervent heat. Look at this now, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for that, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. You see the emphasis on that, on that word diligent, that in your life, the way you are meticulous in doing physical things, secular things, in your office, in your place of work, and the way you are diligent in pursuing a goal you have here on earth, the same thing with the grace of God, the same thing with the service of God, and the same thing with the ministry the Lord has committed into our hands. It says in verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent that she may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Amen. Every blame the Lord will take away. Every spot the Lord will take away. Every defilement the Lord will take away. Anything that Satan can hold on to and then uh, cast aspersion on you and belittle you and say, after all, you know in your heart, you know between you and I, you are not qualified to be in this position. Anything the devil will use like that uh, against you in ministry, the Lord will take away in Jesus' name. The drive and the diligence of divinely approved leaders. Three things we're looking at tonight. Number one, the delight of disciples in assigned leadership. The Lord assigns leadership. He gives us ministry. He tells us this is what you do. And you need to delight in that. Rejoice in that. And you need to give yourself Total commitment into that which the Lord has assigned unto you. Number one, the delight of disciples in assigned leadership. Number two, the discernment of destiny by attentive leaders. The discernment of destiny by attentive leaders. You really need to pay attention to God and know why you are created. 
You need to pay attention to God and know why you are a leader, why you are a minister. We must be attentive and hear that this is the reason I've chosen you and this is what I've chosen you to do and we discern and we understand and we appreciate and we hold on to that destiny because we are attentive leaders. Number two, the discernment of destiny by attentive leaders. Point number three now, dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. He's gone up to heaven. But then he gave us what to preach. He gave us the gospel to declare. He gave us the message to preach and to teach dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. And when we're dedicated to the doctrine, to the teaching of the ascended Lord, it will be a fruit. It will be a fruit in our ministries in Jesus' name. A good day. amen. Point number one now, the delight of the disciples in assigned leadership. What's a delight? What's a joy? What's a commitment? We're looking at Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 1, reading from verse 2. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. His delight, your minister, your delight will be in the word of God. Your preacher, your delight will be in the word of God. And your soul winner, your delight will be in the word of God. You're a disciple of the Lord and you're following after the Lord. Your delight will be in the law of God. And you, have, you cherish that. You understand that. You meditate on that. And it says, in that law does he meditate day and night. Look at verse 3. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth, and whatsoever he doeth, somebody there, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That means any area of work. You're a preacher, you'll prosper in preaching. You're a minister, you'll prosper in ministering. You're a singer, you'll prosper in singing. And you are in any other area of work, that work will prosper in your hand. But to see the condition there, we must delight in the law of the Lord. It is in that delight. And we're meditating on that every time. What does that mean? I'm in an area of the work of the Lord. And I'm meditating every time. How can this work be better? How can more souls be saved? How can more believers be strengthened? How can the church grow? You're meditating every time. It's not only when you have the responsibility on Sunday, I'm going to teach on Sunday, I'm going to preach on Sunday, and so I'm only concentrating on the message. I'm concentrating on the people too. I am meditating. I'm thinking, how will these people go forward in the way of the Lord, in the things of the Lord? We're looking at Psalm 40, and I'm reading from verse 8. Meditate on the word. Meditate on the work. Meditate on the assignment. Meditate on how you can move forward and how you can lead the people forward in the way of the Lord. We're looking at Psalm 40 now, and I'm reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it says, I delight to do thy will. The Lord will reveal his will to you, and you delight in that will. Number one, you delight in the word, in the word of God, in the law of God. You delight in serving the Lord. It's not like somebody is pushing you. It's not like somebody is saying you must be there. It's not like they are goading you every time and pricking you every time and preaching at you every time. You love it. You want to do it. You want to be there. And then in the will of God, it says you, de you delight in the will of God. I delight to do thy will, not just to know it, not just to understand it, not just to appreciate it, 
not just to tell other people, but I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And what was the psalmist talking about here? Look at verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. It says, what I mean is the will of God to preach. The will of God to minister. And it says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. I have not refrained my lips. I didn't use any excuse. I'm having a little headache. I'm having a little stomach problem. I'm having a little restraint. I'm having this and that. You're so delight in the work of God. This is what you want to do. This is what you love to do. And when you are doing it, it's the best time in your life. And it's the greatest time in your life. And you delight to preach that righteousness in the great congregation. I have not refrained my leaves, O Lord, thou knowest. <clears throat> and then in verse 10, it says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. The things I know, the things I know to do, I'm not hiding that and saying I don't think I'm going to give it with all my heart at this time. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. You're preaching salvation because you know the importance of people getting saved. And whatever area of subject you are dealing with, you must bring in the fact that Christ is our Savior. Because without Christ, we're nothing. Be be without Christ, we cannot be saved. And because we know the centrality of Christ in redemption, centrality of Christ in salvation, you delight to talk about the Savior and salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. You are not hiding anything. You are not concealing anything. You are telling the people the word of God, the way of God, and the way of salvation, and you are revealing to them what you ought to know so that they can get to heaven. And you delight in that. You take joy in that. In Psalm 112, I'm reading here from verse 1. Psalm 112, we're reading from verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly. Not just that he delights, but he delights greatly in his commandments. He loves the commandment of the Lord. He cherishes the commandment of the Lord for him, for the people. The Lord has commanded the sinners to repent, and he cannot stop saying that. And the Lord has commanded the believers to be holy, and he cannot stop repeating that every time. Because he delights in the commandment of the Lord. Look at verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. You see, when you delight in somebody, you are not afraid of getting to him. When you delight in God, you're not afraid of praying unto him. When you delight in the work of God, you're not afraid of doing it. There are people that are meditating on negative things, negative condition, negative situation. And because of that, their hearts are filled with fear. And they say, is it at such a time like this, we're going to evangelize? At such a time like this, we're going to win souls? At such a time like this, we're going to preach the gospel? Why are you saying that? Because have you not heard? Are you not in our place? Are you not living in this same community? Look at this, look at this, look at this. We're looking at the Lord, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He is not afraid. And thank God, that's why you are here. You are not afraid. I said you are not afraid because you remember that the Lord is going to secure all his workers. The Lord is going to protect all his workers. No evil tidings and no evil news will make you afraid in Jesus' name. And then he says he's trusting 
in the Lord. If you're serving the Lord, you must be trusting in the Lord. Because if you don't trust in the Lord, how are you going to do the work of the Lord? The very first thing is that you are diligent in trusting the Lord. Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58, we're reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 58, we're reading from verse 13. It says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, that is the holy day of the Lord. By the way, the holy day of the Lord is not an holiday. It's not an holiday to go for picnic and to go to the seaside and to go for celebration here and over there. It says, if you turn your foot away from the day of the Lord, from doing thy own pleasure on my holy day. Not holiday, not holiday. It's my holy day, the holy day of the Lord, that you are thinking about him. And that you consecrate and you commit the whole day unto him. And call the Sabbath a delight. And call the Sabbath a delight. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Glad to worship. And glad to preach. And glad to bring other people to the knowledge of the truth. And you call that day a delight. The holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing thy own ways the day of the lord for the preacher and the day of the lord even for the members is not uh, you know going about their own ways uh, they rush to church and then they rush out and they're going to do extra something study and they're going to do another meeting secular meeting and they count that more important than the work of the lord and the watch of the lord it's a day that is totally dedicated unto the Lord. Not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking in thine own words. You see what the Lord is expecting? That on the day of the Lord, we know that this is the day the Lord has made for himself. That his people will worship him. That his people will preach him. That his people will throw the net of salvation into the sea of humanity and bring many people into the kingdom. It's a day that is totally committed and consecrated unto the Lord. Not that, you know, we give uh, one hour to the Lord on that day, two hours to the Lord on that day, four hours to the Lord on that day, and the rest of the day belongs to us to do as we please. Look at verse 14. If you delight in the day of the Lord like that, and you delight in serving the Lord like that, on that great day of the Lord, totally committed to him, totally abandoned to him, totally sacrificed unto him, totally surrendered unto him. Look at what will happen. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. It's your joy. It's your delight. It's your happiness. And it's the one you delight in all the time. And especially on that day, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. He said, if you honor me, I will honor you. If you exalt me, I will exalt you. If you devote yourself completely unto me, I'll devote myself to you also. If you're a blessing to my people and a blessing to me, I will make you a blessing to you. And it says, he will delight himself in you. And then he will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth. And he will feed you in the famine, he will feed you. In the drought, he will feed you. In the challenges of life, it will feed you. And when there's joblessness and insecurity all around, it will protect you and give you all that you need for your life in Jesus' name. And it will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And what the mouth of the Lord has spoken, nothing will reverse it and nothing will take it away in Jesus' name. Look at Jeremiah. I'm reading from chapter 9, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9. We're reading from verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah chapter 9. 
reading from verse 23 and verse 24 does says that lord let not the wise man glory in his wisdom neither let the mighty man glory in his might let not the rich man glory in his riches look at this look at this verse 24 but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me he understandeth and knoweth me he understands me that i'm the creator he understands me i'm the redeemer you understand me that i am the one that maps out a destiny for him he understands me that i am the one that has hold of his time hold of his life hold i have hold on his talent anyone that is glory let him glory that he knoweth me and that i am the lord which exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things look at this look at this in these things he rejoices in me he abides in me he delights in me he lost my work he lost my calling he says in these things i delight says the lord I pray that that delight of the Lord, the Lord will fulfill in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Well, we're coming to Matthew now. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 24. And then we'll flow on to the first part of verse 25. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough that the disciple be as his master. As the Lord Jesus, our master, our Lord, as he delighted in the will of God, in the word of God, in the assignment the Lord had given unto him, it is enough that the disciple will so delight in the work of God, in the word of the Lord, and he will follow after the Lord without looking back and without going back. We'll continue in that word, in that work, of the Lord, like Jesus would have done it, he was here if he was here on earth today. If the Lord Jesus Christ were here, what would he be doing? How will he be doing it? In the same way, we're going to do the work of God in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 8, John chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 30. John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 30. It tells us in verse 30, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, as he speak these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if he continue, if he continue, you continue in the word of God, in the work of God, in the will of God, in the way of God. If he continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You'll be a real disciple. A good disciple. A disciple that is trustworthy. A disciple that trusts the Lord and depends upon the Lord. But you understand, if you diligently continue, if you tenaciously continue, if you relentlessly continue, if you wholeheartedly continue in my word, the word of God is commandment. The word of God, what has given unto you? If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Somebody said, Amen. Uh, let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 26. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 26. And you see how the people delighted in worship, in the work of the Lord, in the word of the Lord, in the will of God, in the early church. It was their meat, it was their drink, it was their joy. It was their happiness. It was the whole thing for them. It occupied their hearts. 
they meditated on it, they moved forward in that, and they did the work of God as if there was nothing else to do. Look at Acts chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 26. It says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year, a whole year, a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And taught much people. That's a delight that in your community, in your district, in your locality, in your group, in your region, in your state, this is what you are living for. This is what you delight in. You know the work the Lord has committed into your hand. And then it says you teach much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They were called Christians first in Antioch. Why? Because they behaved like Christ. They delighted in Christ. They spoke about Christ. They preached Christ. They taught about Christ. Everything they taught, everything they did, it was all about Christ. And the people watched their lives, and the people watched their action, and the people watched their preoccupation, and the people watched their interest, and the people watched everything they did, and they say, these people are like Christ. It's like when you see a Nigerian, this must come from Nigeria, he's a Nigerian this one must come from Ghana he loves Ghanaian food he loves everything about Ghana because of that he's a Ghanaian he's an American because he's of that place, the same thing is of Christ, his heart of Christ, his mind of Christ, his disposition of Christ, his interest of Christ, his way of life of Christ, everything about him of Christ, and he called them Christians. I pray the same thing will be true of you and true of me. It will be true of us, everyone without exception, in Jesus' name. The delight of the disciples in their assigned leadership. The Lord has assigned something for you to do. And in that assignment, you carry it on. You take it on your shoulder. You take it on your mind. And you meditate on it. And you're doing it every time. And every time you see an improvement, you are improving every day. You are improving every time because it is on your mind. And it is your preoccupation. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Everything is there. It's like nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. That there's nothing you are committed to. It is this work of the Lord. And when it is like that, you delight in that. The Lord, by spirit, by his power, will make it to grow and to prosper in your hand in Jesus name somebody shout amen. amen point number two now the discernment of destiny by attentive leaders now you have to be attentive so that you will understand why you were created you will understand why you are made. You will understand why the Lord raised you up. You will understand why the Lord brought you here. And you will understand why you are in the development program every Tuesday as we are coming. Uh, let, let's look at some scriptures. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 15 verse 18. <clears throat> It says in verse 18, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. I want you to think about that for a moment. If you think about the work, you think about the workers. Let's read that with that understanding. Known unto God are all his workers from the beginning of the world of the world. If we think about his work, we'll think about the ministers too. Read that again. Known unto God are all his ministers from the beginning of the world. When you read that, you understand that the work God has to do and the workers he wants to use, known unto him are all the works 
Known unto him are all the workers. Known unto him are all the ministers. Known unto him are all the pastors. Do you think that somebody becomes a pastor and God didn't know that ahead of time? Do you know that? Do you think somebody becomes a leader that you became a leader, you became a worker, you became a minister, and God didn't know that ahead of time? We need to discern that. And we need to understand that. I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46. And we're looking at verse 10. Isaiah chapter 46. And we're reading from verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. Look at that. Declaring the end from the beginning. All those children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt, the Lord declared that from the time of Genesis that this will happen to the descendants of Abraham. If he knew that those Israelites are coming out of the land of uh, Egypt, didn't he know the man that he will use, the Moses that he will use? Of course he knew. That's what you're talking about. There's a destiny. And you need to discern that destiny. All the people that God used in the Old Testament, New Testament, he knew them ahead of time. And they knew eventually when they got an understanding of that destiny, declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, look at that, the things that are not yet done. From ancient times, before you were even born, before you were born again, before you came into the kingdom, he knew every step he was going to take you through, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He has pleasure in you, and he's going to equip you. And it's going to make you do everything you have to do in Jesus' name. I come back to chapter 44 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44. And we're looking at destiny here being revealed. This man Cyrus had not been born. It took more than 150 years before he was born eventually. And God spoke about him. And God even named him, and God said, somebody is coming, is coming on the scene. I have a destiny for him. I have a work for him to do. Look at this, chapter 44 of Isaiah, and I'm reading from verse 26. From verse 26, it says, that confirmeth the words of his servant and performance the counsel of these messengers that says to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, Thou shalt be built. Look at this. I will raise up. I will raise up. It's not done yet. It's going to be in the future. I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Who is going to do that? Verse 28, that says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. Was not born yet. I see of Cyrus is coming. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the future from the past. That says of Cyrus is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Thank God. God knows all about you. I said he knew all about you. And he had something to do. He work to be done. He work to be assigned. Even in the place where you are now, the people who are going to get saved through you, and the people who are going to know the Lord through you, and the people that will give the almighty pleasure through you, he knew them. And then he says, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and he says to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Look, come to chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, I'm reading from verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Again, remember at this time Cyrus was not born yet. And yet God is speaking to him, yet unborn. Because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows the future from the past. He knows your end from the beginning. Will be a good end. Will be a well done end. 
will be an end that will fulfill the glory of God and the work of God in Jesus' name. He knows your future, and it's going to be a glorious future in Jesus' name. And he knew that future before the beginning. It says in that verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, who said, Right, and I have hold him to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the tulip gates, and the gate shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make thee and make the crooked places straight. He will go before you. He will make plain the path you are going to tread in in Jesus' name. And then he goes on to say, I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, I, the Savior, I, the Redeemer, I, the Mighty One, which call thee by thy name, I am the God of Israel. Look at verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called thee, look at this, by thy name. I have so named thee, though thou hast not known me. Before this man was born, the Lord named him, his son named him, and the Lord said, this is what is going to be when he comes. The same thing you can say about Josiah. What Josiah will do when he comes to reign, the Lord had said it many years before he was born. There's a destiny for you. There's a destiny for me. There's a destiny for everyone. But you see, there must be a discernment of that destiny. And let me come to uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. God knows and sometimes you have not known it. God knows and sometimes you have not discovered it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Look at destiny. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I want you to think about it now. Would you say, God knew about Jeremiah, but God didn't know anything about me. God knew about Cyrus, but doesn't know anything about me. God knew about this, about that, but doesn't know anything about me. Are you thinking that the knowledge of God is limited? That the knowledge of God is restrained? That the knowledge of God is only for this and for that? That the knowledge of God was for that time and not for that time? God knows all about you. He knows the good you are going to do. He knows the ministry you are going to occupy. He knows the work you are going to accomplish for him. You will accomplish it in Jesus' name. Look at verse 5 again. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I set thee apart, and I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. Even when you thought you couldn't do it, the Lord knows you will do it. Somebody there said, the Lord knows you will do it. I cannot speak for I am a child. But the Lord said, now your complaint will not change the mind of God. And your reservation will not change the ordination of God. And your inability will not change what God has already ordained. And your incompetence will not change what God has already ordained. And your complaint, I cannot I don't think I can do anything. I'm not cut out for that. All that cannot change the destiny of God in your life. You will do what the Lord has ordained you will do. A good amen. Your life will be useful. Your life will be progressive. 
and every single determined eternity you are going to do, the Lord is going to fulfill it and affirm it in Jesus' name. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, but thou shalt go to all, thou shalt go to all, thou shalt go to all, that I shall send thee. Nobody else will go to them. Nobody else will reach them. I have not ordained, I have not sanctified, I have not set apart any other person to reach them, Jeremiah, if they have been waiting for you. And I am waiting on you. And you will go to the people that I'm going to send you to. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee says the Lord. It says, Then the Lord put forth his sand, and he touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Is that true of you? I said, Is that true of you? See, I have this day, I have this day said thee over. I want you to understand, I want you to understand, in the far past, before Jeremiah was conceived and before he was born, God set him apart, sanctified him, ordained him to be a prophet. But now in reality, at this time, the time of fulfillment, the Lord now said in verse 10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations, and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. That's talking about you. I said that's talking about you. It will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Yes, he did that in the Old Testament. Does he do that in the New Testament? Does he still know people? Does he ordain people? Does he name them before they are born? And does he commit them into ministry? Does he have a destiny for them in the, in the New Testament? The people he creates and the people he sends forth. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse 13. Luke chapter 1 verse 13. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah. For thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall, that's in the future, it has not happened, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name, what's the name? John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Why? What's he going to do? What has God ordained and what has God put in place? Look at verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord their God. He has not been born yet. He has not even been born again since he wasn't even born physically. And the Lord said, He is coming. And when he comes, you'll give him the name John. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. He has not been born, but when he is born, he will learn the word of God. He will know the word of God. He will know his destiny. He will understand his destiny. He will know why he is coming to the world and is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and in disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The man had not been born, and yet all that he will do, and the result of what he will do after he is born, all that has been outlined. Look at verse 63. Eventually he was born, and the neighbors came around, and they wanted to give him a particular name. And the mother said, no, his name is John. But he said, nobody has a abundant name in the family before. And he gave the tablet to um, the father that he will name him. Look at verse 63. And he asked for a writing tab table and wrote, saying, his name is somebody there. What's his name? What's your name? The Lord knew you before you were born. 
and the Lord has ordained before you are born. Look at the, verse 76. Thou, and thou, child, shall be, the, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Thou, child, you will see a little baby, day eight days old, you are to circumcise him. And now the father said, the Lord has told me what you are going to be. And I believe that destiny, I believe the destiny of God for you. I believe the appointment of God for you. What God has said, nothing will reverse it in your life in Jesus' name. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way and to give knowledge of salvation unto his people. That's what you are going to do. That's the ordination. And that is the destiny. You will give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. And I pray the destiny of God in your life will not be forgotten in Jesus' name. Will not be, you will not be disappointed in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 15. Galatians 1. Verse 15, and, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, look at this man, this injurious man, this is the persecutor, this is the murderer, and this is the one that was going about wanting to destroy the church of God. He had not discovered his destiny, but now eventually discovered his destiny. You will discover your destiny. You will not be roaming here and there and doing nothing or doing something against the kingdom of God. He said, he took me, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal the son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not to a flesh and blood. He realized eventually. You will realize. I said you will realize as we're talking about the destiny of everyone. Or what, are we, what can we say about the destiny? Number one, avoid the despisers of destiny. Avoid the despisers of destiny. Here comes Sir David and Eliab said, what are you coming to do here? And where have you left all the sheep? And then David said, is there not a cause? Eliab was going to despise the destiny of that young man. Nobody will be allowed to despise your destiny. Number two, avoid the destroyers of destiny. Avoid the destroyers of destiny. Look at Saul running after David, wanting to, you know, get him down, wanting to kill him, wanting to throw javelin at him. Does that as a destroyer of destiny? Nobody will destroy your destiny. Avoid the distraction from destiny. Distraction from destiny. The Lord, the Lord has called you that this is your destiny. And there are people that will distract you from that destiny. Nehemiah, come, let us hide in a particular place because some people, they're coming to kill you. They're coming to destroy you. He said, what do you mean? Will such a man like me, a man of destiny, run away to hide somewhere? Nobody will distract, distract you from your destiny in Jesus' name. Name. Avoid deviation from your destiny. Avoid deviation from your destiny. Look at Elijah. He had a destiny. And then Jezebel said, go tell him. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to deal with him. And now he deviated and he ran away. And he said, I'm not fit to live. His destiny was to be raptured. But he was going to, he was deviating. I pray you will not deviate. Number five, avoid the uh, dissatisfaction with your destiny. Is this what I'm going to do? Is all this what I'm going to have? Absalom was the son of the king. And that was good enough. And then the Lord had given him op opportunity. But he was dissatisfied with that. He must, you know, have this and have that. You'll not be dissatisfied with God, what God has ordained in your life. In Jesus' name. Number six, avoid.
avoid disputation of destiny. The people that will get into argument and want to ask a lot of questions, like all the friends of Job disputing with him, you know, you, you don't think you're acceptable to God? Do you think that God has any pleasure in you? Don't you know you're a great sinner? Are you amounting to any sin in the kingdom of God? Avoid disputation with destiny. Number seven, avoid departure from destiny. Departure from destiny. Look at uh, Demas who forsook the apostle Paul. And look at Barnabas. Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have ordained for them. The work I've separated them for. And then eventually because of John Mark and ba Barnabas said, you know, we must take him. But Paul said, are we going to take a man like this who is not dependable? Because of that, Barnabas departed from his destiny. You will not depart from your destiny. I will not depart from my destiny. Now, if you are not going to depart from your destiny, there is not going to be a departure from your destiny. Number one, awaken to discernment of your destiny. Discern discern your destiny awaken to the discernment of your destiny number two awaken to the discovery of your destiny are you just going to be beating about the bush? You are here, you hold this one, you drop it. You are here, you hold that one, you drop it. You are in this uh, district, you drop that one. You are in that region, you want to, you know, do this and that. Somebody is calling you to come for uh, something in another country. Uh, there is a green card uh, waiting for you. And then discover, awaken to the discovery of your destiny. Number three, awaken to the decision for your destiny. And make sure that you are taking a decision and you're taking a stand and you say, This is my destiny. Nothing will shake me out of it. I'm working to the development towards your destiny. What the Lord has said, uh, what the Lord has stretched you for. That's what you are going to awaken to. And you are working to the development towards that destiny. I'm working to the dutifulness in destiny. Now you have discovered the destiny and you know what you are supposed to do. And you are dutiful. And nothing will shake you from that. You have awakened to the dutifulness of your destiny. Awakening to the discipline of destiny. You know, if you're going to abide in that destiny, you must discipline yourself. You must discipline your time. You must discipline your associations. And you must say, that will not help my destiny. That will not leave my destiny. That will not uh, make me go in the direction of my destiny. Therefore, you are waking to the discipline for your destiny. And now, before I go from that point, I'm going to tell you, recognize the daughters of destiny. Recognize the daughters of destiny. I'm reading from Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 14. Men have destiny, and women too have destiny. Um, sister ministers have destiny, and brother ministers have destiny. Awaken to that responsibility. Awaken to that destiny. I pray the Lord will wake you up. Wake up your spirit. Wake up your soul. Wake up your mind. Wake up everything that is dormant in you in Jesus' name. Esther, I'm reading from chapter 4, verse 14. Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall, um, then shall enlightenment and deliverance arise unto the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. I pray you'll not be destroyed. When you abandon your destiny, when you are sidetracked from your destiny, when you go away from your destiny, that's what happens. And then you say, look at this question now, look at this question now. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai was saying, Esther, you have a destiny. And do you know whether you came into the kingdom at such a time like this? I want you now 
you say these women of destiny, these daughters of destiny, or the word leadership, L. Lydia. You can read about her in Acts chapter 16. If you have counted me faithful, and you know that I am cut out for destiny, then come and bring the gospel here. I will receive, I will abide, and many other people will have that gospel. L for Lydia, E for Elizabeth. The angel came from heaven. That's in Luke chapter 1. And he said, Hail, the Lord has uh, blessed you, and the Lord has answered your prayer, talking to the husband. And eventually Elizabeth had that destiny. A woman of destiny, you'll be a woman of destiny. You'll be a sister of destiny. You'll be a daughter of destiny in Jesus' name. Oh, you know, God thinks about the men, and God thinks about the brothers, and God thinks about the overseers. But me, who am I? A for Anna. That's in Luke chapter 2. This is the Anna that lost the husband. This is the Anna that waited upon the Lord. That's the Anna that was praying and fasting. This is the Anna that received revelation of the coming Christ. D for Dockers. You remember Dockers in Acts of the Apostle chapter 9 from the start it says she was making clothes and coats for other people. If that woman did not know her destiny, if that woman was not ministering to other people, when she died, she would just have died like that. But because she was a daughter of destiny, when she died, all the widows were crying and all the widows brought all the clothes and they said when she was there, look at what she did and look at what she did and they said Peter was nearby and they called Peter and he prayed for her and she rose from the dead. Why are I seen from the dead? Because she was a woman of destiny. And what made them to call Peter at that time destiny? And then he for Esther. Esther already have read that to you and says, Do you know whether you are in the kingdom for such a time as this? What's the result of that? Let's look at Esther chapter 8 and I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. Esther chapter 8 and I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. And then the king has said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman. You'll be a woman of destiny. And him they have hanged upon the gallows because he laid his hands upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews. Verse 8 now, as it liketh you, and in the king's name, and seal each of the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. What's the result of that uh, destiny? Look at verse 17, verse 17, and in every province, and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy, had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many, think about this, this is the outcome of the destiny, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. L for Lydia. E for Elizabeth, A for Anna, D for Dorcas, and E for Esther, S for Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and the mother of Isaac, woman of destiny, hold them. That you'll find in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 22 to verse 33. She was a prophetess. And when Josiah was born, and Josiah was to carry out his own destiny, they discovered the book of God, and Josiah did not understand. How are we going to avert all this uh, judgment? And he took it to hold her because they recognized the destiny of God upon that woman, upon that holder. And then I, is Isaiah's wife, Isaiah's wife, Isaiah and the wife, their children, and they are for signs and wonders in Israel. Your children will be for signs and wonders. You yourself will be for signs and wonders. P, P for Priscilla. Priscilla. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles and we're reading from chapter 
18, verse 26, we're looking at um, Acts chapter 18, and I'm reading from verse 26. You'll be a woman of destiny. You will not depart from your destiny. You will not run away from your destiny. You will not run away from what God has called you to do in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. And he began, this Apollos now, to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla, Aquila and Priscilla, always together, Aquila and Priscilla, as the husband was fulfilling his destiny, the wife also fulfilling her destiny. They heard him, they took him unto them, and uh, expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And then we're told in verse 27, and when he was disposed to pass unto Achaia, the brethren wrote, and they exhort the disciples to receive him when he was come. He helped them much which believed through his true grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews at Aquila and Priscilla, administered to him, had taught him, revealed the way of the Lord to him more perfectly. And he did that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. I pray you are a man, you'll fulfill your destiny. You're a woman, you'll fulfill your destiny. We come to point number three now, dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. Dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. We're looking at John chapter 7. We're reading from verse 16. Dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. John chapter 7, reading from verse 16. It tells us in verse 16, these are the very words of Jesus. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus had a destiny. And we've read it over and over. How he told his own disciples after his resurrection from the book of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, all things that were reaching concerning him. And he said, all these were reaching and I came to fulfill them. I am a man of destiny, Messiah of destiny, Redeemer of destiny. And how did he fulfill that destiny? By bringing the doctrine of God. How are you going to fulfill your destiny? By bringing in the doctrine of the Word of God. Uh, look at uh, chapter 28 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. Dedication to the doctrine of the ascended Lord. That's how we fulfill the destiny. We don't go empty-handed preaching the gospel. We don't go empty-handed fulfilling destiny. We don't go empty-handed doing the ministry he has called us to. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. How much power? I said how much power? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe, look at that, teaching them to observe all things, not some things. All things, not majority of the things. All things, not the easy things. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. He said, my father is always with me. And my father's strength and my father's power and my father's presence made me to fulfill my destiny. Now I'm sending you forth with that same doctrine that I have brought. And I will not leave you like the father was always with me and he helped me. I am always going to be with you. I will help you. You will succeed. You will fulfill your destiny. It says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And the people of God shout, Amen. Amen. We're coming now to First Timothy chapter 4. 
First Timothy chapter 4. I will read him from verses 16, 15, and 16. First Timothy chapter 4, from verse 15. Meditate upon these things. All we have heard today, I'm not an accident. You are not an accident. I'm not just here, and God doesn't know where I am and what I'm doing, and the result of what I'm doing. You're not just there, and God doesn't know what you're doing, and the, the result of what you're doing, he ordained you. He separated you. He put you there. You're a man of destiny. You're a woman of destiny. You're not just, if you know, Johnny, just come, and you're just walking here and walking there. I'm trying my best. I'm just doing this. I don't know whether I'm going to be rewarded finally or not. Uh-uh. It's going to reward you. Meditate on what we have had today. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Don't abandon your destiny. And don't uh, forsake your destiny. And don't depart from your destiny. Don't allow any distraction from your destiny. Give thyself wholly to them. That thy profit may, be, may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. As you are fulfilling your destiny, as you are preaching the gospel, take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. You will continue. You will not fade by the wayside. You will not fade by the wayside. You will not run away from your destiny in Jesus' name. Like Elijah ran away and said, it is enough. Kill me now, destroy me now. Uh, before Jezebel comes to kill me, kill me yourself. You will not be discouraged in the path of fulfilling your destiny in Jesus' name. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Somebody shout amen there. If you fulfill the destiny of the Lord upon your life, what's going to be the result? Hell, you liberate sinners. You liberate sinners. You can't say, I mean, the destiny of the Lord. I'm fulfilling the destiny of the Lord without talking to the sinners and without uh, saving them. You liberate sinners. You're looking for sinners every day. Oh, can I touch? Oh, can I turn? Oh, can I transform? Oh, can I help to understand the message of salvation? That's how to fulfill your destiny. Look for those sinners, like great sinners. E, edify the saints. Edify the saints. You come to the church. You are to minister in preaching. You are to minister in singing. You are to minister in ushering. You are to minister in encouraging people. You are to minister in comforting the believers, counseling them. You have one goal in mind. Edify the saints. A is to address the situation. The situations that will hinder people from serving the Lord, address that situation. The situations that will discourage people, address that situation. The situations in town, the situations in the community, the situation in that local government that will hinder people from joyfully serving the Lord and you're fulfilling your destiny. That's why you're there. It's not for you to collapse. It's not for you to go back. It's not for you to throw your hands down in helplessness. I can do nothing. Yes, you can do something. That's why you are there. Address situations. D, demonstrate sanctification. Don't demonstrate um, uh, unsanctified life, selfishness, self-centeredness. Don't demonstrate carnality when something happens that you didn't expect. Don't blow up and don't uh, get angry and don't fret and don't worry. Demonstrate sanctification. That's why you are there. E is to engage soul winners. Enlist soul winners. Edify, educate soul winners. Enlighten soul winners that all the members who are there, all those children of God, the Lord has put you there so that through your ministry and through your own model, you will engage and list and you will educate soul winners are remove stumbling blocks. There's sometimes there are times that you find in the local church in your ministry there is a stumbling block, and when people get to that stumbling block every time they stumble and they fall and they stumble and they fall, and people do not think how we see that they are falling and stumbling at this particular time. Somebody has been serving the Lord very well when it comes to the area of marriage. He falls, he backslides. 
It happens to A, happens to B, happens to D. Remove the stumbling blocks. S is to silence the scoffers. Silence the scoffers. You silence them by the doctrine. You silence them by the word of God. You silence them by your courage in addressing the situations and the issues. E, H is to heal sicknesses. He has sent us out and he has given us the power. He has given us his name. He has given us his word. He has given us the anointing that breaks every yoke. Heal sicknesses. I improve the service. Improve the service. You are in the service and everything from beginning to the end, the way announcement is made and the way the songs are rendered and the way the preaching goes on, people are sleeping. Why? Everything is dull. Everything, there's nothing interesting. There's nothing to wake any, anybody up. Improve the services. P, preach scripturally. Preach scripturally. Go with the word. Go with the doctrine. And go with the backbone. And go with the understanding. The Lord has raised you up. He has a work for you to do that nobody else will do. Nobody will replace you. Nobody will take your ministry away from you. You will do what he has ordained for you to do in Jesus' name. Man of destiny, anyone there? I said man of destiny, anyone there? Daughter of destiny, anyone there? Arise now, rise up and stand in the authority, in the understanding of that destiny. God knows your name. He knew you before you were born. He knew you when you were born again. He knows everything about you. And what he has ordained for you to do, you will do. You will do. You will do. Abide in that destiny and see success in front of you. Pray, tell the Lord, He'll give you all the power to achieve everything He has commanded that you are going to achieve. 